Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Fathers, we call on your holy name. We just praise you and thank you for the opportunity you've given us. You bless us with the health to be here in your house of worship. And we just thank you and praise you for that. So, Father, as we uh, were in Sunday school this morning, and we revisited the cross, you are the only one who could have done that. You're the only one that did do that. And we thank you and praise you that you are the Savior of all. Father, we fail you daily. We ask for forgiveness for that. We pray we just put more focus on you and live each life according to your will, Father. So forgive us of our shortcomings and our sins. May all that is done today bring you the honor and glory. And we do lift up Miss Martha and just pray uh, you'd be with her. Um, you hold her in your hand. And you just say, wait and heal, and she would be healed. So you can call her home. Father, you just meet the needs there, and we thank you for it. Be with the family as they sit uh, by her side. For David and the uh, passing of his father, Jimmy, we just uh, pray, Father, he feels your presence this morning. So thankful that he did get to visit uh, your father not too long ago. And uh, just pray you'd be with that situation. For Helen and the appointment she has this week, we pray things go well. For uh, Bobby Stewart uh, from the group home, Lord, that... Uh, has need we just pray father that you'd continue to be with him uh, reassure those in the home that uh, he's going to be fine and be coming back soon but we leave that in your hand just pray your will be done as we go into our time of service lord we just lift you up and praise you and thank you and we ask father that we would bless you this day and bring you honor and glory and in closing father i just praise you and thank you for working in this church as i walk by the young adult Sunday school class this morning. I just said, wow. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Let's stand together and sing this song, Hosanna.
Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Uh, I just want you to listen to the words of this song, and I hope it blesses everybody's heart. Stillness fill the heavens on crucifixion day. Some say it rained. I don't know if it's true. But I can just imagine 10,000 angels crying. That would seem like rain to me and you. The angels all stood ready to take him from the tree. They waited for the word from his voice. And when
Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come into your house today. We're so thankful, Lord God, that uh, you, you have enabled us to have so much here at Baton Baptist Church. And we're so thankful, Father, for um, the opportunity to give back a portion of your blessings. I pray for this offering today, Lord, that it would be used in a mighty way to tell others about Jesus. There are so many out there who are lost and dying without Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you use this church in a mighty way to tell others about Jesus and his saving power. I pray, Father God, for the remainder of our service today. I pray for our pastors. He brings your message before us. I pray, Father, for open hearts and minds to receive that message that you have for us this day. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, choir. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you. I pray that you are thankful to be here today on this Palm Sunday as we begin our week of just celebrating uh, Easter that will be here next Sunday. Uh, it's always the best week of the year. Amen. 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 Uh, Connie's given me an assignment while she's out today, too. I want us, before I uh, begin to uh, preach God's Word, to pray for our uh, Annie Armstrong often. So would you join me please in prayer? Father, uh, we come to you this morning. Uh, Lord, we are thankful for those that you have called here in North America to preach and teach uh, your word. You've called them to be missionaries on the mission field here in North America. And Lord, unfortunately, this is an area of the world that needs to hear about Jesus just as much as an area in Africa or China or South America. Right here, so many people are lost. Right here, so many people do not know about Jesus Christ and how he can save them from their sins and give them eternal life. So, Lord, we just pray today that all those you've called will make Jesus known. That's the theme this year. And... We know that with this offering, you're going to do great and mighty things. And so, Lord, we just claim right now that through the offering that's been taken up every week and will continue through Easter, 
that you will be honored and glorified by it and that you will use it in a mighty way uh, to tell others about Jesus. Uh, so the Great Commission can continue to go forward. Uh, Lord, we just know that this is a lost and dying world that needs to know about Jesus. Even right around the corner from where we are, from within the shadow of this steeple, people need to know about Jesus. And that's one reason why we're doing VBS and one reason why we support something like this special offering. So, Lord, we just claim that everybody will give according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. During the 19th century, Chancellor Bismarck of Prussia entered Jerusalem riding on a white horse. His army, the Prussian army, had conquered the area. And as so often had taken place, uh, the leaders of the armies would always march into Jerusalem. But his army was so big, so many soldiers, so many officials, that they literally had to take out a section of the city wall so they could all parade in, in formation, the way that Chancellor Bismarck wanted them to enter the city. The gates were too small for this army to enter the way the Chancellor wanted them to enter. So they actually took a section of the wall out just so his army could go into the city. I don't mind telling you, that's a big army. It was a big army. A lot of officials. That's, that's a pretty good entrance when you've got to take down part of the Jerusalem wall. But let me tell you about someone else who entered that city, who made an entrance into the city of Jerusalem. Also riding, but not riding on a white horse like Chancellor Bismarck, but riding on a donkey. And I'm talking about someone that you know, and if you don't know him in your heart, you know him in your mind, and that is our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, riding in to that city on that donkey. As he entered, multitudes of crowds cheering and shouting to him and, and laying palm branches down and their clothes in his path. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. All over the world, this day is recognized and celebrated by God's churches, Christian churches. It is the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. It is also the day that prophecy was fulfilled because this day was prophesied by Zechariah almost 400 years earlier. Let me read you what he said in Zechariah 9.9. 9. The Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. 400 years earlier, Zechariah prophesied Jesus' triumphal entry. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, as we look at the entry today that Jesus made. Last year on Palm Sunday, we looked at the same account in John chapter 12. Uh, we focused on the king last year, but we're going to see some different things about this special day as we look at a similar passage today in Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. 
And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Chapter 21 of the Gospel of Matthew begins the account of Jesus' final week. It culminates where he is crucified on Friday. And then we know that on the first day of the week, which is Sunday... We also celebrate that day. That is the first Easter when he came out of that grave, when he was resurrected. But we look at the week and just are in awe of everything that took place. But really this week began the night before, Saturday evening. When you read the account in the book of John, you see that Jesus was at the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. They were having a meal together. And once that meal was over, the following day, he would make his way to Jerusalem. He had given instructions as we see here. And his disciples brought back the donkey that he would ride on in his triumphal entry. This is a time that all of Israel would have been gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. This is Passover week. They would celebrate it all week. There was something every day that was going on that was part of Passover week. This was no ordinary day, this day of Palm Sunday. Jesus would initiate this week by just really changing the course of history. Everything that took place would change the course of history, but it was always intended to do that because nothing would be the same after he was crucified and after he was resurrected. So why did Jesus come on Palm Sunday? What is so special about this day? Why do we celebrate it? Why do we recognize it today? First, consider the place to which he came. Consider the place to which he came. Look again at verse 1. Jesus came to Jerusalem, the beloved city of David. We know that for years this had been the capital of the nation of Israel. This was their city. It was called many things, one of them being the city of David. But in Psalm 87 verse 3, it is also called the city of God. Now, why is this city so special? Why is it so special? Well, the reason it is special is because this is where God's only Son would save sinners from their sins. That's what makes it special. Now, the word Jerusalem means peace. It is the city of peace. Now, that's hard to comprehend with everything that has taken place down through the centuries. We saw with the Chancellor Chancellor Bismarck from Prussia that he had conquered the city. We know there have been many people who have conquered this city. There's been many times the Jewish people took it back. Other times the Muslims had control over it. Down through the centuries, Jerusalem has been at the center of many, many wars that 
people wanted to conquer Israel and take the city of Jerusalem. How do you call it the city of peace then if it's always at war? It's the city of peace because it is where God reconciled the world back to himself. How often have we heard this question? Have you made your peace with God? Have you made your peace with God? People without God or without peace? You cannot have peace without having Christ. You may think you have peace, but it's something only temporary. If you want lasting peace, you must have the Lord. Isaiah 48 verse 22 says, There is no peace, says the Lord, to the wicked. From the time of the Garden of Eden, mankind has been at enmity with God. Enmity is a word that means a deep-rooted hatred or hostility towards God. The death of Christ on the cross removed the enmity from God and replaced it with peace. Ephesians 2 verse 16 says this, and that he might reconcile them both, meaning Jews and Gentiles, to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Now, years ago, you may have read about the story about the channel. Now, the channel was a connection that was built between England and France under the English Channel. It was a project that started because they wanted to dig this tunnel under the channel, hence the name Channel, so people could have access to the European countries from England by driving to France. And it began in 1988 and finished in 19. 94. It was a project that cost $17 billion. No telling what it would cost today. But this construction of this channel uh, did exactly what they wanted it to do. And today it still provides that driving access. You can get in your car and drive underneath the English Channel. Now, the project did not come without a heavy price. Eight workers died working on the channel. Eight more also were injured, and all of them got injured on the same afternoon when two $17 million digging machines, one coming from the England side and one coming from the France side, digging together, got to the middle of the channel, under the channel, in that tunnel, and when they came together, that's when eight people were injured. But once they did come together, they secured it and it became the channel. And it is still looked at today as one of the great achievements of mankind, an engineering achievement that is amazing that you could literally dig under that sea of water and put a tunnel in, keep it dry, and people be able to use it with vehicles. Quite an achievement. But I may, may I say far greater than this bridge or this connection that man made is the connection, the bridge that God gives all of mankind forever when he bridged between evil, sinful man and a holy God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, when He died on that lonely cross for you and for me outside the walls of the city of peace, the city of Jerusalem. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, He knew why He came. He knew where He was headed. He knew every event that would take place. He knew what would happen on Friday, but He also knew what would happen on Sunday. God sent His Son to Jerusalem to die on a cross for you and for me so He might redeem us from our sins and give us eternal life if we'll place our faith in Him. Revelation 21 verse 3 says, And He will dwell with them. 
and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Let me ask you, will you be counted as his people one day? Are you going to be one of his people in heaven one day? Are you going to be one of the saints in heaven one day and know that God is with you forever and ever and ever? Is there any doubt in your mind this morning that God has saved you from your sins because of what Jesus did on the cross, paying the price for our sins? Can you sit there in peace this morning knowing that you're saved? If not, you can still come to the cross of Jesus Christ. You can still have salvation. Folks, He rode into that city for you. Every one of us, He rode into that city for us. He knew why He was coming. He knew why He was coming to the city of peace. Second, consider the people to whom He came. Now, who were the multitudes that the Bible talked about here that showed up that day? They were there again because of the Passover. But who were the multitudes? Well, the Bible tells us it was Jews and Gentiles. Now, if you, again, if you look into the account in the book of John in chapter 12, it says the Greeks were there. Folks, anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile. So the Greeks are the Gentiles. There were Gentile people there. There were Jewish people there. But I want you to remember, Jesus came first for the Jews as their Messiah. We know that because of what the Bible has told us over and over and over again. He came for His people first. He was there for the Jewish people. There were a lot of Jewish people there, a lot of different kinds of Jewish people there. There were religious Jewish people there. There were Pharisees there. There were rich people. There were poor people, common people, well-to-do people. All walks of life of Jewish people were there watching Jesus ride into the city. There was another group of people there that tell, they tell us in John 12, 17, and, and they're specified in the account. It says the people who saw Lazarus raised from the dead were there. They knew Jesus had raised him from the dead. They wanted to see the man who raised Jesus, I mean Lazarus, from the dead. So they were there as well. Now notice what the Jews said in verse 9. Look back at verse 9 again. Hosanna to the Son of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Throughout Scripture, God had promised them, I'm sending you a Redeemer. I'm sending you a Messiah. He is coming. Down through their Scripture, they knew the Messiah was coming. In Matthew 1 verse 21, an angel said to Joseph, concerning Mary. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. A Messiah was coming. Now he had come. The people are shouting. It is what we call Palm Sunday. Look at what they say. Hosanna. Hosanna. What that means is save us. Save us. But the people were not shouting, save us from our sins. No, they thought the Messiah was coming to save them from the Roman government. It never crossed their mind that the Messiah that God was sending to them would be the one who would save them from their own sins. Unfortunately, some of these same people who are crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord would be the same people just a few days later on Friday who would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Because they changed, their heart changed. They realized he wasn't who they thought he should be. He was an imposter. He claimed to be God. Crucify him. And the sad record of history is that Israel rejected their Messiah. They turned their back on the true Messiah. They rejected Him instead of receiving Him, instead of welcoming Him forever and ever. They crucified Him. Jesus first came to the Jews because He was their promised Messiah. 
Two, Jesus came for everyone else. Not just for the Jews, he came to them first, but he also came for everyone else. By saying Gentiles, when I say Gentiles, that's every other people group you can think of. Every race, creed, color. To a Jew, every other people group is a Gentile. Folks, when Jesus came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he came to save them too. He came to save them too before Jesus ascended to heaven. He spoke to his disciples. He gave them final instructions that we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said, And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Listen to me. Jesus would have never sent them all over the known world if he was not the Savior of all the world. He would have never sent them outside Israel if he was only there to save Jewish people. But he came for all, and I'm thankful for that, that he not only came to be the Messiah for Jewish people, but to the, be the Messiah and the Redeemer for all of us because he is the Savior for all the world. Folks, I've got good news for you this morning. Jesus came for you. And he came for me. He came for everyone. He never left anyone out. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you thankful that when he died on the cross, when he said, I am who I am, the great I am, that he came to die for each and every one of us. For those who had already died who had faith in God, for those who were there then, and for us today, over 2,000 years later, He came for us. He died for us. He shed His blood for us. If you're sitting here today, and you just feel like no one cares about me, no one understands what I'm feeling, and maybe you're just not sure of your eternal destiny, let me introduce you to this Jesus the Jesus of, of the Bible, the Jesus of Scripture, because He came for you. Folks, He cares for you. That's why He died for you. He can give you hope. He can give you peace. He can give you grace. Someone once said this, quote, Jesus came to save the whole world. He didn't come for one set of people. He came for everyone. He came to save the lost, the broken, and the hardened. Jesus came with no intention to condemn a single person. I'm thankful for that because I'm not Jewish and neither are you. And I'm thankful He is a Redeemer of all the world, all of mankind, that He came, as John 3, 16 says, for God so loved what? The world that he gave his only son. On Palm Sunday, when Jesus began his short journey to Jerusalem on that donkey, he came with you in mind. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. Listen, he cares for us. He still does. He loves us. He loves this world. Jew or Gentile, he loves us all. And he also wants you to receive his salvation. I pray everybody here has already received his salvation. But if you're here today and you've never really surrendered your life by faith to Christ, again, he came for you. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. And he wants you to receive his salvation today. For you to come today. Have you been to his cross? Have you been to the foot of the cross? Has he redeemed you? Has He given you new life? Have you received His grace? Folks, grace is the greatest gift we can ever receive. Because it's by grace we're saved. We receive that salvation by His grace. And then third, consider the purpose for which He came. Consider the purpose for which He came. Now, we've already seen that Jesus came for sinners. He came for all of us. Jesus came to die for us. He knew he would die on that old rugged cross. He knew they would take him outside the city and die out there in front of everybody, pretty much naked on that cross, 
for the sins of this world. So we know why He came. He came for you and me. He came for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles. He redeemed mankind by dying on that cross. But I want to give you two more reasons why Jesus came. One, Jesus came in order that we might have a better life. That we might have a better life. Here's what Jesus said in John 10.10. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now that word abundantly means super excessive in quantity or superior in quality. So in other words, it's over the top blessings that God gives us. It's so many blessings, you can't count them. We see that song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. We can't do it. He's blessed us over and over and over again, excessively. And that's what abundantly means here. Now, too many people have the idea that the abundant life has to do with material things and pleasure. But folks... That might be how the world defines abundance. That's not how God defines abundance. It's not about worldly things. It's not about pleasures. Don't be foolish. Don't be short-sighted. Those things are temporary. The abundance that God is speaking about here is eternal abundance. Starting now with this life now. But do you want to know what abundance really means when it comes from God? Are you ready for this? It's very complicated, so listen very carefully. You know what abundance is? You and Jesus. You and Jesus. It's living our life for Him. And in return, He just showers us with blessing after blessing after blessing. You know what I believe, though? I believe there can be people in here today who are believers, you're Christians, but you're not living the abundant life. You, you, you just don't feel like you've had all those blessings I'm talking about. Now, why haven't you had the abundant life? Why don't you feel like you're living the abundant life now? Because you're really not living, you're not all in for Jesus. You have your salvation, you are saved, you cannot lose it, but you're really not sacrificing your life for Jesus Christ. You're, you're not taking up your cross daily and following Him. The abundant life is there, but our part is to give back to Jesus what He deserves, and He deserves our best, our worship, our prayer time. He deserves for us to, to look at right and wrong and choose right. Now, we don't always do it. We're going to stumble, we're going to fall, we're going to sin. But the abundant life is available to us. He wants to bless us, over-the-top blessings. But we've got our part to do. Sometimes we do not know how good life can be because we've never really experienced that over-the-top abundant life. In December of 1990, it looked like for sure that America was going to war with Iraq. The war was looming. And because of that, many reservists were called up. Many in the National Guard were called up. They were all mobilized. But unfortunately, in some families, that meant both the husband and the wife both were deployed. And that still has happened even through Afghanistan and Iraq today. It happened over and over. But this was something new when it happened in 1990 because we hadn't had this kind of mobilization before. But moms and dads were going to all, they were going to be gone by Christmas. 
So this civic club in Forsyth, Georgia, decided they wanted to do something for these children that were going to be left behind. Their parents would be gone overseas at Christmas. So this civic club got with a toy store in Macon, Georgia. And with the backing of the civic club and local businesses and people who wanted to be a part of it, they worked it out so all these kids could come into this toy store and take whatever they wanted, grab whatever they wanted off the shelves, and it would be theirs for Christmas. The TV stations, the local TV stations found out about it. They showed up because they wanted to televise this event. And when they started televising it, people, you know, that were at home, but especially the people that were there, all these kids just running around that toy store, taking anything off the shelf they wanted because they were told, you can have whatever you want. Merry Christmas. But there was one little girl, about 11 years old, that just kind of stood on the side, and she happened to be standing beside one of the ladies who helped put on the event. And she looked down at her and said, won't you go get something for Christmas? Go, go find you something on a shelf. So the little girl walked off, and she walked over to a display of rag dolls. And she looked through the rag dolls. She finally picked one up off the display and kind of turned around and looked at it held it close to her and walked back over and stood beside the lady again and said, how much does this cost? And the lady said, it doesn't cost anything. Everything in this store you can have as a gift. It's already been paid for. And the little girl says, yeah, but what does it cost? She said, no, understand me. It's already paid for. Everything in here is a gift. It is free. You don't pay anything. Finally, that little girl lit up. She understood it and went running back to find more things she wanted for Christmas. You see, it took this little girl a little bit of time to comprehend that anything in that store was a free gift to her, that it wasn't going to cost her anything. It was free. She just couldn't comprehend that at first until that woman emphasized, there's no cost to you. It is free. Folks, sometimes we just can't comprehend the abundant life that God wants to give us. And he says it's free. The price has already been paid by Jesus on the cross. It is free for you. All you've got to do is have a relationship with my son. And if you will be that believer that you are supposed to be, that you are to live for Jesus, you can have the abundant life. It's, it's a gift. Over-the-top blessings. The rich and satisfying life comes from living for the shepherd. The abundant life comes when we live for Jesus. And then two, Jesus came that we might have present help. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know about you, but I need a lot of help. Every day I need a lot of help. And I'm thankful that Jesus hears my cries. But here's the thing. I can't really get the help I need from anybody but Jesus. Bless your hearts. I love all of you. You're sweet people. But the help I need spiritually, the help I need physically, God's wisdom and discernment, I can only get it from the Lord. I can't get it from you and you can't get it from me. God wants us to depend on His presence help. Jesus is my help. Is he your help this morning? I hope he is. Folks, people are limited in what they can do for you, but God is unlimited in what he can do. Jesus came to help us. Let me ask you this. If you were present on that Palm Sunday over 2,000 years ago, which crowd would you have been in? Would you have been in the crowd 
where Lazarus was, where Mary was, Martha, Jesus' mother, Mary Magdalene, Zacchaeus, the sick woman who just wanted to touch, just grab a glimpse, grab a a piece of the cloth of Jesus, the clothes he was wearing. Think she was in that group? I believe she was. People who had been healed, they were probably there. Blind people who had never seen before now, seeing the multitudes and seeing Jesus ride in on a donkey, I'm sure they were there. Or would you have been in the crowd of Christ rejectors who did not believe that he was the Messiah, that he was not who he said he was, that he certainly was not God, but he wasn't the one they were looking for who was going to save them from the Roman government. Which group would you have been in? Let me ask you again, are you living the abundant life for which Jesus came? Are you living a life reaching out to him for him to help you in your time of need? Have you come to Jesus for salvation? Have you already been to the cross? Have you already received your salvation? Do you know that you're going to be with him in heaven one day? But if not, right now, in just a moment, before we partake in the Lord's Supper, we give that invitation for anyone who has not received Christ as Lord and Savior. You need to come to the cross today. You don't need to wait any longer. You don't need to wait and say, well, I'll do it on Easter Sunday. No, you won't. You'll say, oh, you know, I can't do it then. Crowd's too big. It's gone too long. I'll go next week. No, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You need to come today and receive eternal life. Folks, the cross was enough 2,000 years ago. And the cross is still enough today to save us from our sins. Why did he come on Palm Sunday? He came for you and me. That's why he came. That's why he rode in. That's why he made his triumphal entry. He came for you and me. Father, thank you this morning for sending your son. Thank you that he was willing to ride into Jerusalem on Sunday, knowing that on Friday he would die on that cross and suffer, oh my goodness, suffer the cruelty that would come even before he was nailed to the cross. But Lord, once again, we're reminded that he is the one and only Messiah. He's the one and only Redeemer. He's the one and only Savior who came in this world to save us from our sins. And all us Gentiles here in this church, we're thankful that that included all of us, every people group. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Lord, I can only know about my own. I can't know about anybody else's here in this room. But while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, Lord, I pray if there's anybody here who's never surrendered by faith to your son Jesus, that today will be their day of salvation. I'm not talking about being religious. I'm not talking about being spiritual. Those words are thrown around a lot these days. I'm talking about faith in Christ and Christ alone. That's salvation. And if you've never by faith come to Christ, by asking him to come into your heart by faith. Yeah, we all know about him in our head, but you've asked him to come into your heart and you have asked him to forgive you of your sins and you have repented of your sins, then you need to do that today. And you've got to believe in the work he did on the cross, that he died for your sins, paid the price for your sins. So all you have to do is freely come by faith. Because you can't earn it, you can't be good enough. You can't certainly die for yourself and be saved. You're not the sacrifice. Only the perfect Lamb of God was the sacrifice and still is today. We just come by faith. If you've never done that, I pray that when I come down front, you will come and let me speak with you about receiving Christ. Do it today. Don't wait. Don't come up with another excuse any longer. You need to move today and receive Jesus. Maybe today you just need to come and pray. 
And if you're partaking in the Lord's Supper, and that is for believers, during the invitation, you need to pray that your heart's right to receive the Lord's Supper. Make sure everything in your heart is right. Ask for forgiveness, something you've still got there you haven't asked for forgiveness for for sin, so you can partake in this Lord's Supper the way the Bible tells us we are to receive it. If God has spoken to you about joining Baton Baptist Church, I invite you to come so you can be a part of his kingdom work here. As Bud comes to lead us, as Julie plays, I'm going to ask you to stand, I'm going to ask you to sing, I'm going to ask you to pray, but I'm going to ask you to respond if God is speaking to you today. Your sin's been washed as white as snow. The only way that can happen is to come to Jesus by faith. You've never made that decision. You need to come today. unless you can. you to be seated for just a moment. Paul, come on up. I know all of you know this guy here, Paul Walker. He, Pam's over there just grinning from ear to ear. Uh, he, he's been here as long as I've been here, so no telling how much longer before that he's been here. But he came up to me during the welcome and said, hey, I want to join the church today. And so always thankful when God moves in those areas as well. He, he's already saved, already been baptized. I look, I always look at people's birthdays, see if Theirs is mine, but his is not. His is September. But uh, we're just thankful that Paul's coming today. Uh, he's coming on his profession of faith uh, for you to uh, vote him in to this church. I know it's a formality, but it's part of what we have to do. So um, we'll have a motion to receive Paul Walker today as a member of Baton Baptist Church. Second? Amen. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a hand today. Paul, thank you for coming today. Mildred, there you are. You move on me. It's down here for you to get. All right. Okay. Um, I want to read just a little bit of scripture as we partake in the Lord's Supper. Jesus had just finished up what was then the Passover meal, but became the Lord's Supper, what he did at the end, after the supper was over. And it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. 
But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we look back to his death on Calvary. We look back to the cross, his shed blood. But we also look forward to that day when we will be with him in heaven. And that's the day I'm looking forward to. Uh, that will be a day. So he says look back and look forward when we partake in the Lord's Supper. So I hope your hearts are prepared and ready at this time. Turn this over so the juice is on the bottom. Just pull back if you haven't already done so. Get a little top for the bread. And Jesus said, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that your son endured. We know that before he even was nailed to the cross, he was beaten, he was slapped, his beard pulled out, crown of thorns embedded into his head, whipped within an inch of his life. 
bleeding out so badly that he could hardly walk. But Lord, we know that he gave his body for us. It was part of his sacrifice to give us eternal life and to pay for our sins. So we just praise you for what your son Jesus endured. And then on the cross, six hours on the cross, Lord, I cannot imagine the pain, cannot imagine the suffering. Once again, your son Jesus willingly died for us. And we just thank you and praise you for what he did for all mankind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you will just turn it over and pull back top of the juice. And Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, without the blood, there is no remission of sin. We thank you for the blood. We sang about it this morning. Lord, may we never forget that it was his shed blood that pays for our sins. Nothing we can ever do. He's already done it once for all on that cross. And we just praise you, Heavenly Father, for your plan of salvation that gives us eternal life when we come to Jesus by faith. So, Lord, we have looked back to the cross, to that day, that Friday. But we also look forward to that day that we will be with you in heaven. Lord, we just cannot wait to see you forever and ever to be with you at that table where you will drink from the cup. And Lord, we will all drink with you. You've given us that promise. And we just praise you and thank you again for your plan of salvation and for your promise of eternal life. What a blessed assurance that is. I pray for each of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.